Hello. Some of you may have missed this class because it was the day that the technology was not working. So if you are one of those people who did not have this class, um, I think period seven did not have to do these particular summaries. But if you were confused because you were in period seven and you missed the summaries, you can watch this to catch up. For everybody else, revolutionary actions, day seven. Number one, how did the terror and the cost of war lead to counter-revolution? If you remember from our last class, the terror was happening in France for almost a year. The reign of terror was that time when Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety had a constant series of accusations and denunciations about secret spies and saboteurs in the revolution. They had a period of five years of utter chaos. Uh, France had had four governments in five years. Um, and the reign of terror made everyone afraid of everyone all the time. People were paranoid who they talked to. People were paranoid what people thought of them. People were being denounced left and right. And somewhere close to 40,000 people lost their lives in that year. Um, the guillotine was running day and night. Um, in France and in towns outside of, uh, sorry, in Paris and in towns outside of Paris. At the same time, poverty continued, hunger continued, people were starving, um, there still was shortages of food and bread and everything else. And at the same time, also, France was at war with several other countries, including Prussia, Austria, Britain, Spain, the Dutch, etc. Also, things were chaotic. There was a new calendar. They were adopting the metric system. There was a huge system of de-Christianization. Um, and these things all combined to increase the small minority of people who wanted to return to monarchy. These monarchists, these royalists, led a counter-revolution against the revolution. The question is, how did the terror and the cost of war lead to counter-revolution? The terror, the reign of terror, and the cost of war in lives and in money led people to want to return to a time where they had the king, where, yes, they had no rights and no liberty, but at least they had safety and security. They had poverty under the king, they have poverty under the revolution. At least in under the monarch, they had poverty with safety. Now they have poverty and constant paranoia. Question number two, why did the directory put Napoleon, who was from Corsica, in charge of the army? To understand this, we need to look at this picture first here of the royalists um, who had rebelled against the revolution. The royalists called themselves the whites. They carried the flag of the king. Uh, the king's flag was white with little fleur-de-lis on it. And they were trying to rebel against the revolution. They were a counter-revolution. The revolutionaries decided to start with a clean slate and in response to this monarchist royalist rebellion rearranged the government again now in what was their what fifth government in six years they created a thing called the directory the directory was led by five directors who had a little bit more power than the old national assembly um, they had two houses of legislature, two councils, one to propose laws, one to approve laws. These two councils together selected the directors. Um, and then when the royalists rose up in revolt, this directory was supposed to be able to create a stronger central government to appease the interests, make things more safe, more secure, more calm. The directory put Napoleon who was not from France, he was from Corsica. He grew up in Corsica. They put him in charge of the army, partially because he put down the Royalist Rebellion. The Royalists had rebelled. Napoleon brought in the French army and shut down the rebellion. This made Napoleon the savior of the revolution, the savior of France. He saved France from the monarchists, from the Royalists. Question number three, 
How did war in Egypt make Napoleon a hero? So Napoleon was sent out to conquer all of the enemies of France. It's a long story. We're going to skip a lot of it. He conquered the Prussians. He conquered the Austrians. He defeated people in Italy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the war in Egypt is the thing that really made Napoleon's reputation. It really made him a hero. The French sent Napoleon all the way to Egypt to attack the British. Egypt was a British colony at this point. And so in Egypt, by attacking the Egyptians combined with the British, Napoleon was really continuing the fight against the British. Quite famous battle in Egypt called the Battle of the Pyramids cemented his reputation as a military hero. The Battle of the Pyramids, Napoleon and the French win big time. Napoleon, the master strategist, wins the battle. The French are victorious. He uses this to his advantage as a massive PR, you know, public relations move. He uses it to get fame. He and his men, he brings scientists, he brings scholars with him, study uh, Egyptian culture, ancient Egyptian history. There's some propaganda paintings here in the middle about he and his men in Egypt, this famous painting at the top of, of Napoleon considering the Sphinx. All of this was sent back to France, the news, the publicity, the heroism. And the part that wasn't sent back to France was that this was followed by a giant battle called the Battle of the Nile. The Battle of the Nile happened in the Nile and in the ocean outside of the Nile, where the British Navy uh, surrounded and defeated Napoleon's ships. Napoleon is always good at battles on land, much, much less good at sea. The British Navy defeated the French, sank almost all of their ships, and now the French were stranded in Egypt. Um, during this time, Napoleon took his time to uh, study Egyptian culture. There's some debate over whether he actually converted to Islam or not during this time period. He and his men um, continued around the region, attempting to, to conquer places like Syria, etc. He really started to think of himself in this time period as the successor to Alexander the Great or a Roman emperor, someone like Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, um, or Caesar Augustus. All these famous generals and adventurers in the past, classical antiquity, had conquered Egypt, and Napoleon saw himself as walking in their shoes. Then Napoleon heard word that France was in chaos, and so he rushed home to France uh, with in, in two ships, leaving the rest of his men in Egypt to more or less die. Um, and when he returned to France, he was a hero. People loved him. They heard the news of all of his wins. They heard the news of all of his victories. People were hungry for a strong leader, a way out of the chaos of the directory and the revolution and the terror and everything else. And Napoleon seemed to be the conquering hero that they needed. So he was acclaimed as the new leader of France. Napoleon took over the government of France in what is known as a coup d'etat. Uh, coup d'etat is a French phrase. It means like, like hitting the state or like striking the, the government. Um, Napoleon justified this because he was a powerful leader. He justified it because in the same way that um, Augustus justified his own emperorship in ancient Rome. He justified it because he had conquered the world. He had made France safe. He had saved the country. And you know this because he uses symbolism and the aesthetics of the Roman Empire to sort of identify himself with the Romans and the Greeks and not with like King Louis and the other European kings of the Middle Ages. Instead, he's hearkening back to a much more ancient type of leader. By dressing this way at his coronation when he was crowned, he's telling the people he's not going to be the king. Instead, he's going to be the emperor. He's going to be like the Roman emperor. He's going to hearken back to a totally different and way better time than the old regime. You can see some of the symbols in the way he and his wife dressed. Uh, he's got a gold crown of leaves like the laurel wreaths uh, that the Romans wore. He's got a red uh, sort of cape 
thing over one shoulder, similar to a Roman toga. He's got golden sandals, similar to a Roman emperor. His wife has a more natural hairstyle, like a Greek statue. She's got a dress that doesn't have a bunch of poofy padding like Marie Antoinette, but it's much more simple, like a Greek statue. All of these symbols, this sort of Roman Greek aesthetic is his way of justifying himself as the clear, natural ruler of France. Number five, why did some people welcome him as dictator? You would think that after uh, the King Louis debacle, the rebellion against the Supreme King, the rebellion against the absolute monarch, nobody would want a dictator in charge of France. But after several years of complete chaos, many people welcomed Napoleon in as dictator. People were asking in class the other day, you know, were there actually imposters? Were there actually spies? Were there actually saboteurs? Kind of. Throughout the revolution, there was a very small but powerful group of people who wanted to return to having a king. Napoleon has a compromise. He wasn't a return to a king, but he was a return to the safety of a king. And so after almost 10 years of chaos, Napoleon as dictator seemed safe, seemed calm, and seemed organized. These pictures here show us Napoleon, the new hero, the bureaucratic hero, the lawmaker. And he instated or he oversaw the creation of the Code Napoleon, which is a set of law codes that are going to be the same for everyone across the whole country. Some of the other laws that he uh, organized, he made tax collection more fair so that the burden didn't fall only on the poor people. He created a national bank and a single currency for all of France so that trade and business could be done more efficiently. He created free public schools for all boys across France, the famous lycée system, um, no school for girls, uh, because we're returning to a more traditional kind of France, but at least he's going to make public schools for boys. Return to Catholicism. The Christian religion, the Catholic religion is going to be legal again. Uh, the priests could return to power, but their powers would be restricted by the state. The priests can no longer break the laws. They're no longer above the laws. He brings back the regular calendar and the regular hours in the day. Um, he keeps some aspects like the metric system, but the regular clock, the regular 12 hour day, the regular seven day week, those all come back. And it makes people feel good to return to some of these traditions. Freedom of speech is massively limited. Freedom of the press is limited. Slavery returns to the colonies uh, in America. So not all of these changes were good for everyone. Women lost a lot of rights. Um, the slaves in the colonies lost all of their rights. Um, the Catholic Church returns, um, but in a limited form, so the church lost some of its rights. But some people welcomed this because at least it was organized, at least it was safe, and at least we knew that there were going to be the same laws all across France, no matter where you went, you knew where you stood. You weren't constantly afraid that you were going to get in trouble. This portrait of Napoleon shows him as a, a slightly more slouchy, slightly less athletic hero. Here in this picture, he's the hero of the government. He's the lawmaker. Um, he's, he's got his sword over here on a chair. His desk is full of papers. His candle's burning low. It's uh, four o'clock in the morning on the clock back here. His buttons on his coat are undone. He's, he's sort of a relaxed lawgiver, no longer the conquering military hero. He's supposed to be making everybody safe and making them not afraid. Okay, that concludes the lectures for today. Submit your five summaries. Your reading tonight is called Napoleon's Wars. You need to submit your aqua questions before class next time.